thank you very much for having invited me. And um, uh, this. Um, Um, to, to this conference and uh, to, 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 get, uh, to get acquainted with this society and all the work uh, it does. It, it seemed really interesting. I was, uh, I was browsing the, 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 the site before coming and uh, indeed you are doing really interesting work. Um, the title of this conference, Citizens' Commitment in Risk Governance from Inaction to Codecision is really important and, um, and so and the communication I have, uh, I have this title, which I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not sure about this title. I think in the end we might even discard it, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see how, how it goes. It, 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 as Jean Manuel said, environmental communication as a precondition for public participation. Um, I'm not sure about it. It's good when you, you have to put a title on your communication and when you start thinking about it, perhaps it's not right, but we can uh, perhaps discuss it uh, all together and see if it makes sense uh, or, or not. Um, I, I will guide the, uh, this, this communication um, with a, uh, uh, always, I will go back and forth in communication, in science policy interface, uh, and, and it will go on and off, and because I won't have slides, uh, I hope you, you to, to seduce you and uh, to be with me all the time. So my name is Sofia and as, as I said, I started as an environmental engineer and then I evolved into the environmental philosopher. Don't uh, really know if you know the difference, but uh, in the beginning I wanted to, to solve all the environmental problems of the world and now I, I just think about them. <laughs> and, 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 and this is a, a, it's good that you laughed a bit, it's always embarrassing when people don't laugh. Uh, uh, and, uh, and even though this is a, 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 good, a good line for a, for a dinner party, it has a meaning attached to it. Uh, and this is the, the first thing that I always like to say, is this idea uh, that, and I've been working on environment for the past 30 years, and, uh, and, and we solve problems too fast. As soon as we have a problem, we solve it and we don't think enough about it before we solve it. And that's why I think the, uh, uh, yeah, this is important. And, uh, and as we all know, when you, when you have a question, when you have a problem, there are several ways. You can look at it from several perspectives. And usually we only look at the problems from one or two perspectives in the maximum. And so the way we solve it uh, uh, affects the way we formulate the problem. So this is my first thing, and is this idea, the way one formulates a problem affects the way one solves it. And it's, it's quite obvious. Uh, it's, it's a very simple statement, but not always we are aware of it. Aristotle said uh, something similar. He said, the way we perceive the world determines how we, uh, in large part, how we act upon it. So it's this idea that uh, we are much more limited than, than we think, and it's very important to, uh, to, to look at the problems from, from different perspectives. And why do, do, do I say this? Um, I, I say this because uh, uh, in, uh, in environment, uh, the, most, mo the, the, the most common way of, uh, of, of formulating a problem is scientific and technological perspectives. So when we have a problem, then we have to solve it. And even, even if it makes sense in, in most problems, mo a lot of environmental problems are not only scientific or technological. They are also political, and sometimes they are uh, seen as that. There are also economic problems attached to it, and it's good. But where I want to get at, and coming from uh, where I come from, you will understand, is that I understand that environmental problems are essentially ethical problems. And we never formulate them as such. Uh, and so this is, um, uh, this is my sec second thing. Uh, second statement, if, if I can put it like that. Most environmental problems 
uh, are ethical questions, and, th and this, this dimension sh should not be uh, undermined. And if we consider problems such as climate change or biodiversity or sustainable and, and um, production and consumption, you can easily see that uh, they are uh, ethical problems. And if we formulate them uh, the in, in, that, in that perspective, the answers will be different from the ones we are having now and where uh, we are we are dealing now. And, and for me, this is very important for public participation. And that's why I, 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 I mention it. Um, because uh, the importance of um, environmental uh, communication for public participation uh, sh should bring this, this component into it. And uh, uh, the, the, the idea of having these informed decisions uh, that when, when, uh, when we, we use participation in decision, we have, to be, we have to know what we are doing. And we have to know scientifically, but not only. And that's the thing. If we have a more broad uh, understanding of the question, it's the public participation will be more rich and more open to more different types of people. Uh, this is uh, um, the, the idea that scientists, they, they tend to restrict in, in public participation and not uh, the knowledge that is discussed to, to science. Uh, but, but the thing is that the, the, the normative assumptions about what is valuable, just, right or good should also enter the, the, the equation and uh, so the, the, the value of uh, philosophical uh, analysis uh, lies in making explicit the normative assumptions uh, and so critically asking uh, whether those assumptions along of course with scientific facts justify certain uh, policy decisions or, or conclusions. Um, so this is the, 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 coming back to, to, to the theme of, of uh, environmental communication and uh, its importance for, uh, for um, public participation. Uh, it, it, for me it's important not only for uh, pr promoting citizenship but uh, for me personally, environmental citizenship, which is uh, 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 what I think is uh, we we need it, we need a lot, and so I would like to to introduce uh, uh, another theme, which I'm sure you're very familiar, um, uh, and and for the environmental science, of course, is is very is very important. Is how we deal with not only uh, uh, risk, which is your field, but also with uncertainty, with ignorance with uh, uh, complexity and also with value commitments. I, I will always come back with always this ethical and philosophical approach to how we, we deal with problems. Um, and uh, I've, I've, worked, I've worked at the European Environment Agency in Copenhagen for, for several years and uh, a long time ago. And at that time we, we launched a project on, on the precautionary principle and we, we wrote a book that I was co-editing uh, called the Late Lessons from, from Early Warnings uh, about the, the precautionary principle. And uh, in that book we differentiate uh, risk, uncertainty, and ignorance. I don't, I'm not sure if it's a, a common way of the, how the, the things are, are, are defined, but in, in ignorance you don't, know, you don't know if something will happen or when or why or how. Uh, on uncertainty, you know something will happen, but you don't know when and how, and you don't know any probabilities. And in risk, you know something will happen, and you can calculate the probabilities. So these are the, the, the three different levels of, of, um, um, of these attributes. And uh, of course, the latter is your world, the risk, and it's uh, a very established science, uh, as you can see with, with this uh, society and the risk. Uh, analysis and assessment and characterization and communication and management. I mean, uh, risk is, uh, in, in fact, uh, already a, a big discipline. But for uncertainty and, and ignorance, um, the precautionary principle has been 
uh, the, the instrument, the, the, the policy tool, the, the conceptual uh, uh, mind frame to, uh, to deal with it. Uh, and so this uh, comes the question uh, uh, how to communicate ignorance and, uh, and uncertainty. How, how can we communicate and how do we want people to make decisions upon, upon things that we, we don't know <laughs> uh, or that the, they are uh, uh, uncertain. And in the environmental questions, a lot uh, ignorance and uncertainty are happening uh, uh, all the time. Um, so the, this, this question can normally have, a, a, if we so go to another level, another framing, uh, which I would like to enter now, it is the science policy interface and the, how is this relationship uh, uh, organized. Um, and so there are a lot of questions that will come up for us to try to uh, 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 analyze better this, this question. And it's epistemological questions, methodological questions, institutional uh, questions. And uh, so thinking about the commitment of the citizens, which is the, the main title of this, uh, of this conference, and how to take them from inaction to co-decision. Um, as, as the title of this conference challenges to, 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 to do, what is the role of the science policy uh, questions? Uh, and if you think on the epistolo epistemological questions, then we should be looking into things like what is the role of science and of scientists, and they cannot be uh, sort of confined to the traditional role of uh, discovering. And so there is this need, and this has been more than 20 years that we are talking about this new contract, new social, new, new social contract for scientists, which is scientists should study uh, uh, what, uh, it should address what is the mer most urgent issues for society and not for what they want. And on environment, this is the, has been a, a long process and uh, environmental justice uh, came exactly from that, uh, from uh, from that uh, idea that uh, we were not studying what uh, people wanted us to study. Uh, and uh, th there is this film, Erin Brokovich, for example, that is very clear about it. This idea that uh, there are no scientists living near landfills, for example. So th they were never studied in particular because we study things that are more sexy and more nice and give more papers and not really what interests the people. So this, this new social contract that I think more than 20 years we've been talking about it and it's, it's really uh, important. Uh, and this is this sort of questions that we should all, all, always be aware of. It's not that it's something new, but it's something that we, it should always be nagging us uh, whenever uh, we do science. Um, another interesting epistemological issue is the boundaries of, of science. And, and here again enters the, the importance of, of uh, uh, philosophy uh, because science is a, a value-loaded uh, uh, social process uh, whose frontiers are fuzzy and, uh, and, uh, and, and therefore we should be uh, uh, enlarging uh, the limitations of, uh, of how we uh, uh, look into, in, into problems. There was this joke, then again it's 40 years old, but it's still uh, uh, sometimes it's still it's still actually it still uh, uh, still exists. Uh, what was it? Uh, uh, science is made by old middle aged white men, so they study things that imp are important for old <laughs> white uh, middle aged uh, uh, men. Um, and so uh, these are, are the sort of questions that we should uh, always uh, uh, be aware of. Methodolo me the methodological questions are also important when we're looking at this in the science, in the science policy interface and uh, how can we sort of seduce the public to participate. So when and by whom are methodologies uh, defined and evaluated, uh, if, the, if the processes are open and transparent, uh, uh, the, the choice of relevant scales, disciplines and methodologies is also important uh, as 
uh, and again, this comes back to my, my first statement, the identification of the issue. What, what, what are we uh, discussing in the end? So uh, in this public science policy interface, we have this epistemological and this uh, logical questions, but also, of course, the, the institutional problems, uh, institutional questions. And for that, I still, I still believe that the principles of governance that uh, you are all aware of, the openness, participation, accountability, effectiveness, coherence, are the best and are val valid and relevant and should always guide us uh, in the way that we look at institutions and, 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 and how they, uh, they work. So all this opens, I think, the process and challenges the public, challenges the scientists, ch challenges the, the, the policy. And so from this in, in, informing policy models, we have to this mutual learning models uh, that demands uh, uh, and is a reflection of uh, this democratization of knowledge, which is what is most important also here in, 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 in risk uh, and, and, and risk, risk governance. So, it's okay. Uh, so, uh, if I summarize sort of my narrative uh, up to now, it, it's this, the, these three things: how we formulate the problem affects how we solve it. Uh, the importance of framing environmental questions as ethical uh, perspective, and uh, the science policy interface is a dynamic process. And even more when uncertainty, ignorance, risk, complexity are, are involved, and those are very usually attributes for environmental questions and this is a challenge so for, 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 for all of us. Um, so now uh, if we come to the, to, to the theme of this conference of uh, how to seduce the public to participate, to pass from inaction to co-decision and coming back to my theme of how to communicate in the environment and how to engage the public in the environmental issues uh, and I, I would like to come back again to the importance of, uh, of ethics uh, and this idea that ethics poses as questions that are uh, relevant for our life and how we are in the world. And these questions make us reflect and when we reflect then it's more uh, probably that we will participate and we'll be more citizens. We are we, never, we, we don't think enough about things like what should I do, how should I live, uh, what type of person do I want to be, uh, what are the values that should guide what I do, uh, how I live, uh, who I am. And uh, if, if we think on, on these ethical questions on our own lives, this will immediately trigger some reflection that will make us more active and, and, and more active citizens. Um, and, and, and the questions to these answers, which are personal and each one answers them as they want, the important thing is that we think about it. Who am I and what type of person am I? And do I want to be what I am? And should I be a different person? Should I be, should I be more active? And we should sort of be awakened. We are very sort of dormant, not thinking enough about these questions because everything is always so fast and things are happening all the time. Uh, and, and so these questions make us think and help us argue and explain and justify the criteria for our actions and then we can. Uh, and, and so I, I think the, that the first role of environmental communication is pointing to the ethical uh, dimensions of environmental problems and not of the problems themselves um, and, and, and of their uh, relationship with our lives. And uh, environmentalists, and me included, we, we, we tend to be, to be very often some irritating moralists. Uh, you should do this, you should do that. For example, when I came here, I thought, ah, oh, God, I don't want a plastic. Uh, and, and this is very irritating. We, we're very moralists. You should, you should recycle, you should not use your car, you should, you should and you should not. This is uh, environmental communication is, is loaded with, uh, with this moralism which is quite irritating. Um, and, and, and we should avoid this. So we should avoid 
being uh, moralist. There, there is an ethical dimension to all problems, but uh, this doesn't mean that we have to be always irritatingly moralists, even though we are, and I am, <laughs> and I'm sorry, sorry about it. Um, as also, I think we should, uh, in, in environmental communication, avoid inundating people with facts and uh, indicators uh, uh, that are tiring, that we forget them five minutes after we, we've heard them, um, and, 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 and because the, the, the indicators and the facts uh, are, are limited w without a narrative that frames them. And very often we don't have, we just have the, the graphs and, and the indicators, and there is not a big narrative around them. And, and, and this also, is also a problem of environmental communicators. Uh, we also tend to, to, to ignore different contexts, and for different people we have to talk in different ways. Then again, Aristotle is very good in his rhetoric to, to, to how, what are the different problems and, 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 and how you should talk with them. Uh, and this also we, we tend not to do. And we also think that our messages are universal, which are not. Um, and finally, we also are a bit owners of the truth, of the absolute truth. I know. I know how to solve the problems of the world. I know the planet is in risk. I know the climate change. I know everything. And so we sort of the owners of the truth. Um, and for me, these are the current problems of environmental communication. The, the way we are communicating is not engaging enough because we know what we are communicating too well. Uh, we know the problems, we know the biodiversity problems, the climate change problems, all the problem, environmental problems that we are, we've been studying them for so long that we know them. And because we know them, we impose them on the others. And this is not the best way uh, uh, to communicate. Um, so uh, we should transform, again, this communication into a more for, into a more philosophical type of communication which makes people think and to reflect and in that sense perhaps awaken them, uh, awaken them to, to, to the problems. And uh, storytelling, which uh, actually is quite fashionable nowadays, we're always talking about storytelling, how to communicate uh, with a story it might, might be a, a better way uh, to, to pass on questionings and restlessness and taking us outside our comfort zone that convenes us to make us think and reflect upon, awaken us to, to the, the ethical me, to the ethical us, uh, and, and therefore pushing us in a way more organic into active citizenship. So if, um, so, and uh, 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 Manuel uh, spoke about the, this walk I did, so in, in my, my personal quest for having a story to tell, um, a narrative to inspire people uh, to think more in, 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 in the environment. I decided to walk from Lisbon to Oporto, um, paying a bit homage to Greta Thunberg, which is this Swedish girl that I, am, uh, I really like her. 300 um, kilometers. Sorry? 300 kilometers. Three, three, 370 kilometers. <laughs> <laughs> well, so last time I was in Coimbra, I crossed it. Uh, by foot today, I took a taxi from the hotel. <laughs> it's a very, uh, uh, now we have Uber. So we <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but um, so I, I, I managed to, to speak daily to a to a, to a Portuguese radio T TSF. So every morning I talked on what I saw and on environmental things and questions that would come up. Uh, uh, to my mind, and for 70 days I walked around 30 kilometers uh, a day, and um, and uh, the, the story that I want to talk about in this in, 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 from this walk, uh, I, I, I I usually summarize it in in, 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 in three concepts and questions, and, and the first one is is time. Uh, and uh, I, I was not really efficient when I was walking. Um, I, wa I was never in a hurry. I went slowly. I softened my rhythm. And it was really 
refreshing and liberating not caring about time. I just had to be, uh, just had to get somewhere to sleep at the end of the day. Nothing else, just work. Uh, and and a, a slow life uh, with no need to hurry, uh, not, no need to something new and something fast and what is happening and what are the news. Uh, it was really liberating. So the, the first question, the first concept that I think is important in, in, in this narrative of mine is if we rethink time and accept it at a slower pace, what would that do to the environment? So it's, it's just, just a question. The second, the second thing is silence. I, I was walking on my own, uh, almost all the way on my own. So these are days, days, days and days not talking to, to anyone. I thought I would talk with a, a lot of people. My, my first idea was I would talk a lot with people and talk about this, but in the end, I, I didn't. I, I, you start walking in silence and you start to, first you think a lot, and you think in all directions because you don't have anyone to, uh, to talk to. Your mind goes all over the place. Da, 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 you think, you think, you think, and then suddenly you, start, you stop thinking, and this is really nice. Because when you stop thinking, you you start feeling, and this is you start feeling more, much more, you, you're much more aware of all your other senses, and you, you be much more, you are much more aware of the smells, of the sounds, um, of the landscapes. One is usually aware, but essentially sounds and smells, because you are much more empty, uh, you're not rationalized, you don't have words. And this is very, 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 very liberating uh, 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 as well, because you you get you, you get you get free of words and of rationalities and of thinking and judging and uh, questioning. You 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 do nothing. Uh, you just are uh, attentive to the world uh, uh, around you, and so you you. Uh, you pass beautiful landscapes, and then you hear the birds, and then you hear the leaves, and then you hear the water from the river, and then a bit later, you I passed, for example, in an, an enormous forest of eucalyptus, and there was the absolute silence. No, no, no birds, not even crickets. It was not wind, so not even the leaves were making sounds. And this is very powerful. It's much more powerful than anything else when I would talk about uh, eucalyptus forest, is the silence that you have in it. And it's, it's just, uh, it's, you just get aware of it. If you walk and if you're there, you're sort of ready to, to, to understand it, uh, that. Um, so, uh, and so you, you, you feel the heat, you feel the cold, you feel the rain, and I, I got the whole thing. I did this in April, in May. And I got cold, I got hot, I got uh, wind, I got rain, I, I got the, <laughs> the whole spectrum of weather because th this time of the year you, you, you get it all. And from the north to the south you get it all uh, as well. And so uh, this made, made me feel grateful. I think that it's a, it's, it's a, good, it's a, it's a good feeling. This, uh, I'm grateful for the world and grateful for nature. And, and you feel this. And you feel this because you are in silence. Um, so the, the question again is, if we are more attentive to our feelings and to our sensations, what would that do to the environment? So this is my, uh, my, second, my, my second thought about my, my walk. And the third and last one is, is, is frugality. First I thought on austerity, but then that was very much <laughs> political loaded. Uh, but frugality is also a nice word, I think. Frugality. Frugality. Because that, that's the thing. The, so for these 17 days, my, my life was very simple. I had my, 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 my rucksack, my sleeping bag, two books that I didn't read, uh, which is amazing for me because I'm always reading. Um, Too tired. <laughs> no, not wanting to be uh, uh, rational. It, it's, it's very, it was a very strange thing. The, the only thing I, I only focused because I had to speak on the radio every day at 9 o'clock in the morning. So I would wake up at 6 o'clock and start walking with, with, the, with the sun rising, which is beautiful, beautiful always. And I would stop around 8 
organize what I would say, would say it, and then again free until 8 o'clock in the morning next day, in the sense that uh, completely free. Uh, but anyway, so I, I have nothing, the, the sleeping bag, the clothes, with the, uh, a book uh, that I didn't read, and slept in hostels, slept in uh, Casa de Misericordia, in schools, in very simple, in uh, Sometimes I have, <laughs> I have also Tiago, that you might know, once uh, borrowed me a house he had somewhere. And, um, and I had very little and I needed nothing. And this is, my, my, and I, I work, my, my, my field of studies of uh, sustainable consumption and production. So I'm always talking about this having less, producing less and consuming less. Uh, but there, then, then you, 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 feel, you feel that indeed we, we need very, very little. So the question is, again, if we give up uh, much of our material life, what would that do to the environment? So, so, so these are the, the, the three. So my, my story is this, is time, time, silence, and, and, and frugality. And so I hope I've inspired people uh, to think so with the radio interventions, I, luckily I was on TV as well in, in the beginning and, and at the end because I was associated with Zero, which is a, a Portuguese NGO and they have good communications and so I, I managed this. And, uh, and so these are the, the three things that I hope make people think. So I'm not telling anyone things. So I, 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 it's, 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 it's just a, it's, it's just a, a story. And uh, even though I was reading in the newspaper the other day that stor stories and, uh, are, are, are what make us go forward. And there is this, this Monbiot, uh, George Monbiot, uh, I don't know if you know, it's uh, an, uh, an English journalist. And he has this, one of his uh, papers is about the, uh, the importance of narrative in, 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 in political in, in the political world. And he says that uh, last century we had essentially two big narratives. And the first one it has to do with this room is the, 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 the key, key, key Keynesian uh, story uh, and then the neoliberalist story. And the two stories were perfect stories. They had the good, the bad, and the savior. And all the stories are like this. We are in the chaos, there is these bad guys, comes the good one, fights, saves us, and we are all safe. All the stories are like this. And uh, the keynes, the social democracy is, is, has this story. After the, the Great Depression, this is a big chaos, we need the state to organize it, this is good. and it makes all sense and we all bought it. And then later on the neoliberalism is the opposite. Oh, the state doesn't that doesn't allow us to do anything, we cannot grow, we cannot do anything, so we need this, so it's very simple, but it's this idea that we have a narrative and everybody thinks, yes, this makes sense. It, it makes sense, one thing makes sense in, in a particular time and the other one may, makes sense and so we all embraced it. And now we don't have any narrative and we lost, I think, after the, the big crisis, uh, now we have bits of social democracy and bits of neoliberalism and we don't have a story, we don't have a narrative. And so politically we are a bit lost. And I was reading the newspaper the other day, Antonio Guerreiro, which I really like, he, he writes in, uh, in public on, on Fridays, and he's saying politics don't have narratives anymore and we don't need, need narratives. And all politicians, what they what they live off is of uh, clashes, is of uh, words that uh, make sense to people. So this is not a narrative, and uh, and especially especially the the, 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 the extremes and uh, Trump and Bolsonaro and uh, uh, Italy. They, they don't have a story. They just have words that people like. Concepts very 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 limited, and we don't have a big story anymore. So I, I'm not sure we need stories or if we need words that make us think. Uh, I think, I still think stories are, are better. Uh, 
least my children always preferred stories just uh, and I think we all like stories and that's why we go to the movies and we read books so I, need, I think we need to have a story and in the environment we need to have a story in, in politics we need to have a story and that's the way we, we can better communicate then again perhaps we have here a communication expert <laughs> and he can uh, say something about it later so to finalize it um, I, I would, uh, I would say that ethics is a fundamental discipline to enter the equation on public uh, discussions and namely environmental uh, questions. Uh, that is really important uh, uh, that we think about values and what matter most to us to understand what the, are the values that matter to others uh, so the discussions might be more rich and uh, there are conflicting values and this is fair enough there is no problem with having conflicting values but if we are aware that what we are discussing is conflicting is values and not the, 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 the problems we get lost in discussing things without really being aware of the values that are guiding us this, is, uh, this would foster much more respect for the other when we are discussing and so more um, more, more, more uh, uh, productive and constructive uh, public participation um, processes. So with environmental uh, communication grounded around understanding the values we share, uh, public participation, I believe, would be much more uh, uh, productive. And so the, the, the last thing I would um, introduce is the, the idea that sustainability is a value. If sustainability is a value, a moral value, uh, this is what I would like to, to propose uh, to you. And, and I, 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 I will study environment, or I've been working in environment for the past 30 years, and I will study it 30 years ago. And there, there, there in college, our dream would be that politicians, people, uh, policy makers would talk about sustainability. You know, I mean, we opened a, a bottle of champagne each time a politician would say environment. It, it, was, a, it was an event that if someone would say environment 30 years ago or sustainability. Now it's the opposite. <laughs> I think we, if, if, uh, 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 it, it's difficult not to hear sustainability and everybody talks about sustainable and sustainable development and environment. Uh, and, and it's all over the place. And so it's almost like uh, an empty rhetoric, one might think. They say it just to say it. Uh, and we might be a bit depressed about it. Very often I say I'm a, I'm a eco depressive sort of person <laughs> because we've been uh, working uh, working on environment we go very very little forward but anyway but then again uh, if, if we think if we think in another perspective if everybody is talking about environment or is uh, talking about sustainability. Uh, then, then, then it's okay because then we can assume that it's already structuring our lives, and uh, and uh, other values such as freedom or solidarity or democracy that are also around us and are not perfect. And everybody talks about them, and then uh, not everybody uh, lives li lives them. So it's okay that sustainability. Everybody is talking about sustainability, and half of the people don't don't feel it. At least it's there and is already uh, uh, structuring. Um, so this uh, this is also is my this my idea that is important. I think that sustainability is already um, is already a value in our societies, and this we should also discuss. And if this guides our discussions, then things will, will be different. So promoting ethics and uh, value-based decision-making uh, might uh, improve processes of public participation. I think that's, that, that's the way I would like to finish my, my talk. Thank you very much.